Good morning. I'm Bill Ashton, the director of the Rural Development Institute here at Brandon University, and we're glad to have Dr. Emily Eaton join us today to talk about the oil industry in Saskatchewan. A couple of quick technical notes. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you'll notice that there's a chat box and a Q&A. Uh, please put uh, any, just type in any of your questions that you've got along the way. And at the end of the presentation by Emily, uh, we will come back and, and go through those uh, questions uh, with answers. Um, we also want to give a proper introduction to Emily. So I've asked the, both our technical support and, and the introducer today, um, in terms of Otis, to be able to uh, introduce the topic and also introduce uh, Emily. So over to you, Otis. Emily's presentation today will shed light on, on oil's rural reach, social and environmental impacts in Saskatchewan's oil producing, producing areas. So Emily's presentation today will uh, shed light on the oil industry in Saskatchewan. So uh, we all know the uh, booms and bucks of the oil industry in terms of oil exploration and the process, in terms of the long and existing implications depending on the size of exploration activity and also in diversification in agriculture. We also, we've also witnessed uh, changes in rural urban mobility and also the labor market in uh, oil producing areas and also the challenges the oil industry comes with it in terms of oil exploration in rural communities. So uh, without much uh, I do, we will have more to listen from uh, Emily from the stories she had in uh, interviewing 80 people in her research and also the oil industry in Saskatchewan. So oil is not new to Saskatchewan, but a recent boom from 2006 to 2014 associated with uh, unconventional oil extraction, including hydraulic fracturing, has left its mark on rural lives and livelihoods. In this seminar, uh, Emily reviewed the social and environmental impacts associated with Saskatchewan's rural oil boom. So she argues that predominant silence among rural residents about these impacts is largely due to the industry's influence and its penetration of everyday rural institutions and culture. So her research is based on the 80 interviews, as I talked about, with farmers, ranchers, school uh, teachers, regulators, environment and environmental consultants and human services uh, providers. She also uh, based her research on uh, the oil workers in rural oil producing uh, communities. So Emily Eaton is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at the University of Regina. Her research investigates the political ecology of oil in Saskatchewan. She is the author of Fort Lines, a new book published in the University of Manitoba Press, Life and uh, Landscape in Saskatchewan's Oil Economy and of Growing Resistance. Without much as I do, I'll turn back to Bill. And Thanks, Otis. Um, you'll see that we're now joining um, Emily in her presentation. Um, in the first couple slides, she's been able to, uh, one, uh, talk about the, the particular um, industry itself, the various extraction uh, capabilities, so it's a very diverse industry. And she now begins to now talk about some of the results that she's had in terms of, uh, of, of the interviews that she's conducted. And so we join Emily in this process. Percent of the mineral rights in Saskatchewan are held by the Crown. Um, then um, they can have a company drilling on their land um, without any say into, um, or without any consent given and any say into where and how the drilling happens. Um, and it's, in my opinion, really good that um, these farmers are on the land because they're often the first people that, to find leaks and spills, and they're out checking up on their land every day. Of course, with rural consolidation happening, um, this is less and less the case. Um, and there's more and more absentee owners of land um, and increasingly fewer um, civilian or civil society eyes, I guess, on, on, the, um, oil, on the oil industry. He takes detailed notes of every single incident that's happened on his land, and there's just so many of these now. Um, you can 
see a little bit about his story on my website, um, which is sasgoyle.org. Um, and um, yeah, just to give you a sense of, of what I was doing um, during my field work. I'm going to move on though, because again, I have a lot I want to get through today. Um, so to give you a little bit of a sense of what I think the major um, oil impacts are in terms of environmental impacts in the province, um, these I've investigated as sort of specific to Saskatchewan. So um, one of the things that we have a big problem with in the province is spills and leaks. Um, one Saskatchewan regulator um, told me, and I quote, we have a tremendous amount of problems keeping our product where it's supposed to be. Um, and if you look at the province's um, spill database, there's over 15,000 reported spills since 1990. Some of these are very small, um, and um, the industry would claim do almost no damage, although I think um, even small spills have... Um, can have um, effects even into the um, long term. Um, but for many farmers, the problem is not so much the spilt oil, but also the um, spilt water. And when um, companies are extracting water from um, these formations, it's very salinated. Um, and when it spills on um, either grasslands or on cultivated um, fields, it impacts um, the farmer's fields um, and in the case of native vegetation allows for sort of little beachheads of noxious weeds to enter into um, the native grasslands. Um, so spilt water is a big problem as well, um, but the spill database includes um, oil, water, um, natural gas, um, and, and any other fluids used by the um, industry. Um, and we've never had a sort of cumulative impact assessment of, of what is the impact of all of these, um, what the industry likes to talk of as, as small spills. But we also had recently in Saskatchewan a bigger spill that um, received widespread um, media attention across the country, um, and that was one of um, 200 cubic meters, 200 to 250 cubic meters into the North Saskatchewan. Um, and that was a spill that, um, uh, sort of ignited a little bit more um, attention to the industry in Saskatchewan. That, that was in the summer, this past summer. Um, so this is just a quote from a landowner, and I think it's significant because it shows, uh, and now I'm not in presenter's view, so you're seeing my, <laughs> all these things in the background. Um, you are, I think it's significant but because it shows the way in which the tough position that um, landowners are often in in rural areas in Saskatchewan, um, where the communities are small and they know um, often the people who are um, working for the companies and who are in roles of remediation, for example. So I'll just read it. They put a battery site over there and they had a saltwater spill there and they never told me about it at all. It flowed off lease onto my land. When I went over to see it in the spring, I couldn't figure out what the heck had gone on because you could see that they'd taken it and scraped something up. I couldn't figure out why they, have, why they had ever done that until that year and along the battery site there, nothing would grow. That's the effect of the salt water probably. So when I figured out they had a saltwater spill over here, they never said anything, and then Talisman took it over. Um, so again, something characteristic of the oil industry that the wells are always changing corporate hands. I was fighting with them. I'll tell you, my sister-in-law was the one I was fighting with. I'd had enough, so I phoned Mines and Minerals down in Esteban. They came up, and I took them out and showed them. He said there was never a saltwater spill reported. So again, something that had gone unreported. He went to Talisman. So the sister-in-law came, had to come back with her tail between her legs and start paying me. So then they finally put in, uh, they drilled a sump, they put a culvert in, and they were pumping surface water into a tank and disposing of it because there was salt water in the, wa in the groundwater. And this is a typical story that I heard. Um, spills not being reported, fights, um, um, between landowners and the companies in order to get them cleaned up and the difficult position that landowners and farmers and ranchers are often in um, where the people that they're negotiating with have some um, family ties or or friendship ties um, uh, to themselves. 
So another oil impact that I'm um, concerned about is the increase in venting and flaring um, that has accompanied um, the oil boom. Of course, the boom has subsided a little bit since 2014 when the oil prices crashed, but we did have um, from 2006 to 2014 a large increase in um, uh, multi-stage horizontal fracking in the southeast of the province where the fields are very um, sour. Um, and alongside the increase in um, drilling was a lot of uh, venting and flaring. So if you take a look at um, the national inventory reports that were provided to the UN framework on the Convention of Climate Change um, that give um, Saskatchewan's contribution to greenhouse gases, um, you can calculate there that um, 17.4% of Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emissions, the total greenhouse gas emissions from Saskatchewan, um, are actually um, from fugitive sources um, from one industry, and that's the oil and gas industry. Um, so these include pipeline um, leaks, methane leaks, um, wellhead leaks, um, spills, emissions from um, just the oil and gas industry. Um, and those contribute over 17% of our total greenhouse gas emissions. And in Saskatchewan, um, we have the highest greenhouse gas emissions per capita um, in the province. Um, and so this is significant. I, a couple of years ago, the number um, was into the over 20%. Um, so it's the government is reporting that it's decreasing. There have been new measures. Um, new regulations brought in or directives brought in to address this, um, but I'm not sure it's having the kind of impact that the uh, ministry would like it to have, partly because companies can um, opt out of this when they, um, if, they're, if they're in sort of um, financial pressure. So if, if the, well, I won't get into it. <laughs> um, it'll take too long. Um, so this is a significant impact, I think, of the industry and one that's often overlooked, um, that, that waste from just one industry accounts for so much um, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, another one that I'm concerned about is what I would characterize as the significant loss of fresh water from the hydrological cycle. Um, the Saskatchewan Water Security Agency isn't worried about this, um, uh, but I think it's significant um, because um, the water that's used by the oil and gas industry is often lost from the hydrological cycle. So it is pumped deep underground into underground formations. Um, and if it flows back, it's also disposed of in disposal wells um, deep underground. And therefore, at least in human um, time scales, it's lost from the hydrological cycle. Now the Water Security Agency will tell you that the oil and gas industry only uses 1% of Saskatchewan's total, total water use in a year, so that it's um, less significant, for example, than an industry like potash. Um, but again, this water is, um, is lost from the cycle. Um, and in my research talking with um, farmers and ranchers, they'll, they report that not all water is actually permitted and reported to the water security agency. And so landowners are often in the, in the um, practice of selling access to um, little sources of water on their lands, like through sl sloughs and dugouts. Um, and those wouldn't be captured in the 1% statistic. Um, of course, with um, hydraulic fracturing, uh, there's even more water used, um, and according to one environmental agency in the province, um, a number specific to um, Saskatchewan for fracking would be about up to um, 400 semi-tanker loads for a multiple stage um, fracking job. Um, and finally, the, the final one that I'll highlight today is the fragmentation and loss of native prairie um, due mostly to the physical imprint of the oil and gas industry. And again, absent any sort of cumulative effects assessment, each individual well gets, um, uh, you know, sort of flies through the um, Ministry of Environment because maybe its individual footprint isn't very big. Um, but I think, as um, I'll show in the next slide, that um, the cumulative impact of these can be pretty significant. Um, in 2001, it was estimated that Saskatchewan um, only retains about 17 to 21 percent of its native prairie. And as you can see here, this is um, a map that was provided to me by the um, 
uh, PFRA, the Prairie Farm Rehabilitation Administration Community Pastures um, Program. So this is a community pasture in Eagle Lake. Um, and this is um, an oil company that wanted to put in a new pipeline actually through the pasture. You can, I don't know if you can see that, but the green here is the edge of the community pasture pasture and this is the new pipeline they wanted to put in the red line um, and they um, in order to put it in had to provide a map to the community pasture of all the existing infrastructure so you can see here that each one of these is a, a, a well pad and these would be flow lines they'd be underground but nevertheless even the underground flow lines um, cause um, especially in the years when they put them in can cause um, significant disruption and if they're not reseeded well to native species um, they can become um, little again places where noxious weeds can spread out into the remaining pasture so this is a lot of infrastructure on a single um, pasture and you can see that those are quarter sections um, there's not um, a lot of room and this is one of the more impacted pastures um, but there's not a lot of space where there isn't um, oil infrastructure and it would be really important I think I'm not the kind of scientist that could do it but to have some sort of cumulative effects assessment of um, what the impact is of um, all of these wells and infrastructure um, and this is from a PFR PFRA staff talking about more fragmentation that's the bottom line the more activity the more chance there is for human error which leads to spills soil issues such as admixing impacts and erosion our focus has been towards topsoil preservation and that's one of the most th serious things i see going south with development is the topsoil loss so the denser the surface leases the more chance of oil risks to soil the map i just sent you um, on a pasture that has a lot of development for the last 40 years and there's everything from 40 to 50 year old wells to last year's wells there and what the oil industry has done with that land i do believe this land use is in question there's been all kinds of pipeline failures surface spills from trucks there's been soil issues period in the pasture on the map i sent you we have no material left on dugout banks or anywhere to make available to the oil industry anymore and the spills are increasing there as far as pipeline failures pipeline integrity is a huge issue wetlands are a huge issue um, and just a note here i think that the public's imagination of pipelines are the big interprovincial lines that connect um, uh, or that bring oil to market um, and certainly when those fail um, they can be really large spills but what we're talking about in this context is sometimes you know two inch pipelines that are flow lines between wells they don't have any of the kind of safety measures in place that the large pipelines would have like shut off valves or or um, you know there's nobody sitting in a command center um, monitoring them so when they fail they might go um, you know unnoticed for a long period of time and and the leaks would be slow because there's not a lot of pressure and the pipeline is small but they can nevertheless do um, significant amount of damage so that's just an overview of some of the environmental impacts I wanted to turn now to some of the social impacts and just to give you a little plug here um, some of what I'm going to talk about today um, comes from a book that I just published along with a photographer, um, Valerie Zink, um, and it's called Fault Lines. I'll actually be reading a few excerpts from it. Um, and yeah, here we go. Um, are we okay to continue? I, there's no feedback, so it feels kind of funny, but um, I'll just continue until someone tells me that something's not working. <laughs> Um, hosting the oil industry. So I already mentioned that farmers and ranchers and other landowners are often unwilling hosts to the oil industry. 75% um, of mineral rights in Saskatchewan are held by the Crown. Um, and so therefore most farmers and ranchers who have, um, where the province has sold the oil rights below their land, um, have no say in whether or not an oil well will be placed on their land. Um, and Contrary, I think, to public opinion, they're actually not getting rich out off of this infrastructure. So certainly, um, if an individual owns the subsurface rights, the mineral rights, um, they can get um, handsomely rewarded from um, oil and gas, from the oil and gas industry. But if they don't, they're making, my research shows in Saskatchewan, between $2,000 and $3,000 a year on a single well. 
Um, and that is that number um, was is derived at because it's supposed to um, compensate them for the lost productive use of their land. So really, um, they're supposed to be breaking even from um, the oil infrastructure on their land. Um, it's supposed to be compensating them for the, the agricultural use of their land. And farmers and ranchers will tell you that um, those who've had wells for a long period of time um, will tell you that um, often they're more nuisance than they are um, benefit. Um, and that's because um, those wells can fragment their farming operations. Um, they live with spills. They live beside flare stacks um, that they believe cause them um, health impacts. They live with the noise of the industry, garbage and weeds. All of these things are really popularly reported by um, farmers and ranchers. Nevertheless, um, because of the um, type of, of farming economy we have, um, uh, especially fault, small family farmers, if you have a number of wells on your land, that can be the difference. Um, it's a stable income every year. It doesn't fluctuate like the um, global commodity prices for um, grains and oil seeds. Um, and therefore it can be make the difference between retaining um, a family farm and not. So I don't want to downplay that either. But it's not as if um, those who don't own the mineral rights are sort of getting rich off the oil industry either. Um, in the book, I also looked at um, those who were working in the oil industry. Um, and um, one of the oil workers I interviewed characterized it as either feast or family. Um, so the cyclical periods of boom and bust in the industry, um, where you're either feasting or you're at home um, uh, on layoff or without work for long um, periods of time. So ge even general laborers can find all sorts of jobs um, in the many companies that contract to oil companies, often without the requirement of grade 12. These laborers can make between 30 to 35 hours, uh, 30 to 35 dollars per hour working 12 hour shifts and various rotations um, with as many as 10 to 12 days on in a row before they see a day or two of rest. Some even pick up shifts on their few days off. In a good year, they can pull in $100,000 or more. And these are general laborers. So of course, the more um, uh, specialized labor makes even more. However, oil field work also comes with a whole lot of uncertainty. During the spring, when municipalities impose road bans on heavy traffic in an effort to conserve grid roads, many people are without work. This is known as breakup, and it's a period that can last from four to eight weeks. In years of severe flooding, as was the case in 2011 in southeast Saskatchewan, rig crews logged as few as 90 days of work. Uncertainties around work are not just seasonal. Some oil workers have no set schedule at all. They don't find out until the day before at what time they work, and they don't go home at night until the job is done. Many workers are also often on call, especially those driving trucks that vacuum up fluids or working other equipment that would be called out to deal with an unpredictable event, such as a spill. The long hours and few rest days and time spent away from loved ones is taxing on what one psychologist I interviewed called the family unit. Many oil workers were brought up and reside in the small communities that surround Saskatchewan's oil patch, and they have traditional family lives that include spouses and children. According to this psychologist who sees uh, many of them as patients, spouses of oil field workers are increasingly identifying as single mothers. This phenomenon is only exacerbated in the case where oil field workers commute hundreds of kilometers, sometimes from neighboring provinces, following short-term contracts. In a campground that I stayed in in Lloydminster, the weekends were distinctly different. Those who had a couple days off left their trailers to travel home to their families, and others hosted children and partners who traveled to spend time with them at the campground. However, the sights and sounds of children playing were always temporary. The psychologist explained that many of his patients experienced family breakdown and divorce, not during these long periods of separation, but after men returned home from more permanently, such men had a hard time reintegrating into the family since routines and social supports had been built around their absence. In these contexts, men often felt unneeded and unwanted. Um, speaking with women in the industry, I also found a predictably uh, masculinist workplace culture. 
Um, this is one um, woman, th this photo is in, in the book as well, in black and white. Uh, Mandy, that um, we talked to in, uh, the, in the Shaunavan area. And she um, was 22 in the photo, um, and she was a swamper riding in the passenger seat of a vac truck. Um, and that's a truck that um, vacuums up substances like water or drilling mud and hauls them away for disposal. Um, and when she obtained her class one license, she gradually graduated to the driver's seat and admits that she hasn't seen any other women in her position. She left home at the age of 15, um, worked at a hog barn, cleaning hotel rooms and selling Mary Kay in whatever time remained to make ends meet. And what she likes most about the oil patch is that she no longer has to piece together multiple jobs in order to make a living. Um, so she says, it's nice having one job. I may work a 12 hour day, I may work a four hour day, it doesn't matter. I don't have to go home and get ready for the next one. I can just go to bed if I want. Um, so, you know, it, according to different um, women that I interviewed, again, this sort of um, ambiguous um, uh, relationship to the oil industry, where on the one hand, they're really thankful for um, the type of work that they have, considering other work that they've had in their lives, but that they're also um, operating in a very masculinist um, workplace environment. Um, one of the significant things that I found in these oil producing areas is the sort of dichotomy between oil field and non-oil field wages. Um, so a huge gulf sort of develops where on the one hand, if you work in the industry, um, even as a general laborer, you can make more than $100,000 a year. Meanwhile, um, people in the accommodation, restaurant and bar industries, all of which tend to boom alongside the um, boom of the uh, of the oil patch um, are making barely above minimum wages and this causes all sorts of um, problems um, and this is gendered as well um, women are another group of workers that are often overrepresented in the jobs that service the oil patch um, and its workers um, and one effect of this pay gap is that the public and nonprofit sectors have a hard time attracting and retaining workers, yet the services provided by these sectors are increasingly in demand. So according to a psychologist in the Southwest, the relatively low wages and non-oil field work has motivated women with partners in the oil field to exit the labor market in order to take care of children. The long and unusual hours of the oil field combined with the high costs of childcare um, has meant that women are incentivized to provide their own childcare at home. This only further exacerbates the problems of retention and recruitment in public and nonprofit sectors, which have traditionally um, been home to high numbers of um, female workers. Um, so again, uh, problems both in the um, accommodation and hospitality industries with those workers making so little in comparison to the oil field workers but also in the um, public and nonprofit sectors um, in the hu human services. One way that the province has tried to deal um, with um, the accommodation on hospitality sector is to bring in um, temporary foreign workers. Um, and so these, there have been changes to the program, but we don't have time to get into it today. Um, but these workers leave their communities in, um, and in, in the case of Saskatchewan, the countries that I heard most represented were the Ukraine, um, India, Mexico, and the Philippines, and other marginalized areas of the world in order to enter Canada on temporary visas that bind them to a single employer. In Saskatchewan, these workers are increasingly recruited to fill low-paying positions in the accommodation and food sectors, services sectors. Less than 1% actually work in, the, in oil extraction itself. The number of temporary foreign workers in the accommodation and food services sector has climbed from just 45 workers in 2005 to 2,300 workers in 2012. Um, the accommodation and food service sector now employs more temporary foreign workers than any other sector with the construction industry employing the second largest number in the province. And often how, how these workers survive um, is by um, living in 
like with large numbers of um, people in, in relatively small accommodations. Um, I already mentioned some of the gendered impacts or the gendered nature of the industry, but there's also gendered impacts. Um, so the housing boom, the low vacancy rates and the strange social services that come along with um, booming uh, oil industry um, have gendered impacts. Um, when I talked with people um, who were in uh, um, working in um, spousal abuse um, uh, agencies, um, they talked about how women stay in, uh, they talked about um, their experience of seeing women stay in unsafe relationships um, in order to access housing. In other words, if the housing market is really tight, you might um, not um, leave an unsafe relationship um, for fear of, of being without um, housing. And this also impacts not the, the nonprofit's ability to uh, um, deliver services to women in these circumstances. Um, so they used this one nonprofit used to have a deal with a um, hotel um, in the adjacent community um, that would reserve every night would reserve one hotel room for um, as an emergency shelter. Um, but um, they lost that deal in the during the boom time um, when um, an oil company um, was. Um, renting out the whole floor um, and when um, the hotel industry was so um, full. Yeah, so the housing list is still three to six months. Um, so you're saying to people, you need to stay with them. Where before, we always used to have people call us and say, we've got an extra room if you ever have a woman leaving. Within a week, within probably 24 hours, we found them a place to live. Now it's not even an option. It's almost gotten to the point that we don't even look because there's no place. I just saw something flashing. Is Am I still? Oh, that's a chat. You're okay, Emily. Continue yeah, yeah. on. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, this is um, just in relation, and now again, some of this seems funny because since 2005, we've actually had a bust, and I'm talking about boom times. Um, I, I can talk a little bit more about the bust if you want in um, the question period, but um, this is an interesting uh, um, housing development. It's um, made out of um, sea cans, um, uh, shipping containers, each one of these um, it's a it's a hotel, long long term. Most of the people who live there are actually there for longer term. Um, and this was a farmer who, in his barley field, decided to um, retrofit these um, shipping containers and make this um, hotel, <laughs> uh, it just outside of Esteban. Um, and I did talk to some people living there um, who were really grateful for the. Um, uh, for the for the housing and who were sharing it you know these really small living spaces with um, partners and dogs and and everything um and just yeah to give you a sense of how tight the housing market was in the summer of 2014 the average rental price for a two-bedroom apartment in the city of Estevan in the heart of southeast Saskatchewan's oil patch was $12.75 per month, more than the average price for similar accommodation in Canada's top three metropolitan cities, Vancouver, Calgary, and Toronto, where that's what it was reported. So in the last few minutes, I just wanted to give you a sense of um, uh, new direction um, that I'm going in terms of this research on oil in Saskatchewan. I'm part of a larger um, SHRC partnership grant. Um, the PI is Bill Carroll at the University of Victoria, um, and it's also co-directed by the Canadian Centre of Policy Alternatives, Shannon Daub, out of um, out of the Vancouver office. And that project is looking at the, it's called Mapping the Power of the Carbon Extractive Corporate Resource Sector. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, but it's looking at corporate power in the um, carbon-based resource industries of um, Western Canada, so oil, gas, and coal. 
And as part of that larger project, I've been working with um, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives as our partner in Saskatchewan um, on a small project um, that we were calling Oil's Rural Reach um, uh, Social License in Saskatchewan's Oil Producing Communities. Um, and so I spent last summer um, doing some interviews around um, the industry's corporate social responsibility initiatives in rural areas um, and, the, and um, the ways in which they are viewed by um, local communities and the ways in which they maintain social license. Um, so the real emphasis of this research is to investigate how the oil industry shapes um, everyday institutions of life in rural areas. Um, and some of the ones that we were looking at um, include sports and recreation, um, cultural events, local governance, critical infrastructure, um, and education. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do, because I don't have enough time to do all of them today, was just to give you a snapshot of some of the things we found around education. But this slide just shows you, there's, it goes on forever. I couldn't put it all in one slide. But it just shows you um, we tracked um, the uh corporate oil donations to three municipalities um in saskatchewan um and we made a spreadsheet of the donations based on a scan of newspapers from 2010 to 2016 um so over a six-year period um and by also using annual corporate reports and websites um so that it's likely incomplete and there's many that you can't see on the there. Um, but this is just to show you a little bit of, of the sort of scope of um, corporate donations from the oil industry. So those can be anything from um, donations to fund um, uh, family health clinics. It's And these are often um, for equipment um, less um, and not so much programming. Um, obviously sports and recreation, um, but everything to things like um, purchases for ambulances or the purchases of ambulances um, uh, and the fire department there at the bottom there's a few more fire department um, equipment defibrillators um, all sorts of things that we would consider or that we're calling anyways critical infrastructure things that um, are really required in um, communities um, but are being financed um, by um, the oil and gas industry. So their reach is really wide, everything from, you know, sponsoring local sports teams to um, really critical um, needs of communities. So now I'm going to just finish by um, telling you a little bit about what we found in terms of education. Um, and so in the education sector, um, uh, there's both direct and indirect involvement. So in terms of direct involvement, um, the community um, has the responsibility or communities have the responsibility to raise money for upgrades um, and expansions um, to school, to new school infrastructure. So one of the places we looked was at a new school that was built in, in Oxbow, a little town in Southeast Saskatchewan, um, the New Prairie Horizon School. Um, and they did receive provincial funding um, for building it, but in order to um, upgrade it and to expand it to meet what they considered the community needs, they embarked on a $1.2 million community fundraising initiative. And I can't remember now the population of Oxford. It's really tiny, uh, under 10, way under 10,000. It would, it would be just a couple, no, maybe even, a, I can't remember. It's very small community. Um, so raising 1.2 million um, was a, a significant initiative. Um, they received um, donations from CNRL and Red Hawk Well Servicing, um, both gave $100,000 each, um, and they attributed the rest of their fundraising success um, to um, the, the oil field wealth in their communities. So a lot of the local oil field service companies also kicked in anything from, um, you know, $5,000 to $50,000 um, in order to, um, it, um, in this school upgrading initiative. And what they were doing was expanding the gymnasium um, and building a multi-purpose room. Um, and these were, again, not funded by the provincial government over and above what the provincial um, government um, was providing. 
Um, so we can see here that the oil industry's um, charity quite literally allows rural people access to educational opportunities that might not otherwise that they might not otherwise have. Um, we can also see direct involvement in terms of um, uh, sort of curriculum. So here we have the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers Energy in Action program. Um, this also happened at the new Prairie Horizon School in Oxbow. Um, they came in and they built um, an outdoor classroom um, in, con in collaboration with um, the school, the principal, and um, particular teachers. And they also, in this process, did um, uh, uh, provided in-class presentations um, that deliver what they call industry context um, to um, students. Um, they've also done this energy in action program that often involves building these outdoor classrooms, sometimes also bird feeders um, and some other random um, projects um, to other communities across Saskatchewan, including Elrose, Weyburn, Maple Creek, Carlisle, um, and Carnduff. And this program is self-described as an energy and environmental literacy program for students, primarily in grades four to six, in underserviced schools in rural communities where there are oil and natural gas operations. The program consists of in-class presentations that deliver this industry context on key themes like examining renewable and non-renewable resources, the use of natural resources to meet energy needs, values of natural resources, um, et cetera, et cetera. I won't read you the long list. Um, and industry also sponsors scholarships and awards um, in these communities. And one interesting interview I had with um, an oil women's group um, was around their fundraising initiatives to sponsor uh, uh, an oil scholarship in a local um, community um, uh, community college that was directed prim um, first and foremost um, at women. And then um, indirect involvement includes um, or has an effect on the perceptions of the value of education. Um, and we notice that um, in oil booming areas that enrollments suffer for males. Um, this is a quote from a teacher. I have difficulties keeping the boys in school until the end of grade 12 because they see the big money that people are making or they perceive it's big money and keep them going towards their grade 12. That's my biggest problem with the oil industry. I've had kids who would work summer jobs for an oil company, a drilling rig company or service rig company come back to school in September and probably won't stay past Christmas. They get a little taste of money and they're gone. So certainly, um, the, yeah, the value of education is shaped by the oil industry as well. Um, and just I'm getting right to the end here, I realize that I'm probably bumping up against the end of my time here. Um, this also um, uh, has a gendered element again. Um, there's a gendered pay gap for females that I've already mentioned, but that starts actually right in high school. Um, another quote from a teacher, I had one grade 12 graduate, she felt she had to go and get a post-secondary education because in this area, a female is not going to get a good paying job without one. But I think the girls certainly see the difference as they are growing up in high school because there aren't as many jobs outside of school hours that suit the female in this area. Unless it's those traditional female positions, you know, that might be secretarial work for two hours after school with the minimum pay compared to the male shop hand who might be making $5 more an hour. Um, so you can see this gendered pay gap developing right in, in at, the, at school age once um, high school students start working. Um, and certainly in terms of teachers, um, many have had to supplement their salaries to deal with inflated costs of living. Um, a lot of teachers have summer jobs or they're working a couple of jobs to keep things um, going or tons of teachers have quit to go to the oil field sector when it was booming because the wages were higher and the benefits were better. Um, so again, a lot of ways in which the oil, the oil industry both in directly and indirectly influences um, the uh, 
education in rural areas. So what, we want, what we've learned from this research is um, looking at the literature on social license that it often assumes um, that social license must be continually renewed through sort of transactional purchases by companies um, who are perceived often as outsiders. Um, and who are developing greenfield sites. And what we found in Saskatchewan is really that the oil industry isn't new, it's not a greenfield um, industry. Um, it's actually seen as part of the community, not as um, an outsider um, and not as, um, you know, a, a large multinational coming from outside um, and imperiling um, the community. It's often understood as a homegrown industry. There's a high level of trust um, and threats to industry are often understood um, as threats to community. So I'll leave it at that. Um, I have here on my last slide just my email address. Feel free to email me. And if you want to check out the website, saskoil.org, um, it's there as well. And I can hear my baby crying in the background, so I'm getting kind of distracted, but um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks, Emily. Bill Ashton here. Um, great presentation, um, a sense of not only just who you've interviewed um, over the, the last number of years, but also giving us a sense of the kind of nuanced um, sort of challenges and issues and also opportunities. Um, I, I know there, I'm, I'm looking at the Q&A to see if anybody's going to write some questions. So as we're waiting for those questions to come in, is it okay if I ask you a couple questions? Absolutely. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, and, and I, and I want to, this one, this one's actually a personal experience. And so um, I'm just wondering to what extent the oil industry, in terms of how you describe it, impact on communities is much different than other industries. And so when I grew up, I grew up outside of Windsor, Ontario, the auto industry, Fords, Chrysler and GMs were booming um, out of high school. You literally, who sponsored our graduation, were the three corporations. Um, I can remember coming off the stage with my high school diploma um, or high school certificate, whatever it was at the time in Ontario. Um, and there was literally, you were picking up information about opportunities for jobs. Um, out of over 100 graduate students or high school students, for me, three of us went to university. Um, and so I know this was, you know, I'm dating myself, but. Um, this phenomena is not a new phenomena. So I'm, 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 as you said, this oil industry is not a new phenomena in Saskatchewan either. How does it is it is there is it any different than some of the other industries when you have either large industries or or single industry communities that mm -hmm. often that's the show. Um, the market says people are free to choose if they want to stay in high school or not. Um, I can remember going back to a class reunion. And, and literally was, was you know, I, I was so disappointed in the general attitude that I left that I ended up leaving early for my first, uh, first high school reunion because it was seemed to be a negative thing to have gone off to university. <laughs> right. That, yeah, that's well, question. thank you. For, okay. Uh, should, yeah, I'll start there then. Um, thanks for the question. Yeah, I guess, I was thinking about comparing it with other um, resource-based industries. And in that way, I think the social license bit is a little bit different in the sense that if you think about like uranium mining in Northern Saskatchewan, you know, there's a large multinational corporation that comes in that's perceived as an outsider. Um, and that does have to sort of buy in a lot of ways through continual, um, through continued transactions, a social license in the community. And in that way, I think that it's different in, in the oil producing areas where a lot of the oil field service companies are sort of homegrown um, and where the industry itself, even if it's headquartered in Calgary, isn't really understood as um, an outside threat to the community. Um, but I think you're right, if we could compare it with other um, like not necessarily natural resource based industries, but um, manufacturing is interesting too, I think. Um, one thing that I would point out, I think with the oil industry is it's really contracted out nature and the lack of unionization. So I would think that th that would be different. Um, there's almost no, uh, like there are some unions in the larger sites in Alberta, the industrial sites in Alberta, but in Saskatchewan's oil patch, it's small um, 
there are no sort of large industrial sites. It's dispersed across vast territories and there's really no unionization um, except for it and maybe pipe fitting. But, um, and so it's really um, contracted out. Um, and I imagine that that would like, you're, you're talking about sort of um, uh, corporate sponsorship, let's say of certain things. And I think that that would probably be um, similar to the extent that um, the manufacturing industry wanted to get really involved in say the curriculum or building um, schools or um, uh, in some of those, you know, in some of the ways I think that we've seen in Saskatchewan, it's a result of uh, uh, significant um, ideological <laughs> struggle um, in terms of how the public is going to perceive the oil industry. And it's a really um, uh, divisive issue right now, I think, across across the, the country. So I think the industry is getting involved in oil producing communities in ways to solidify its its legitimacy, not just in those communities, but as a good um, corporate citizen and in order to reproduce students who are um, not critical of the industry. So I would think that those maybe take on a slightly different flavor than, for example, in manufacturing. But thanks yeah. for the question. It's a good one. Okay, we're, we're still waiting for others to, to chime in with their questions. So um, let me just add a follow-up question to that because I, um, it, a sense of there's lots of pieces that you've put in front of us today from the various perspectives of, of ranchers and, and the, some of the service companies. Um, it, there's, there's multiple technologies being used. Um, it, it has ups and downs, of course. Um, is, there, is there a sense of, uh, and in addition to that, I think there's, there's also a sense of in the industry itself of trying to give back to the communities, um, being a... a somewhat of a corporate citizen in terms of the of the in, the monies that they're they're trying to do where you talked about transactions mm -hmm. in the balance is 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 there something um, e either wrong or is it is the system working which is our market system with the regulatory um, government agencies i'm i'm not i'm in the balance what's your what's your opinion in this because i'm not quite sure the summative piece of this is 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 what 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 what's my what's my takeaway message that you want me to have um, <laughs> overall? Oh well, I couldn't get into the regulations because there's there wasn't time. But Saskatchewan's probably the least regulated jurisdiction in in the country. Um, the Fraser Institute's Global Petroleum Survey um, ranks at number one in Canada in terms of policy perception index, and number three jurisdiction in, all, in the whole world in terms of sort of ease of doing business and the perception of industry, of the regulations and the competitive environment, et cetera. So um, I think, yeah, my, I mean, my takeaway message around regulation would be that it's um, really sorely underregulated. I think that the, the ways in which we've um, uh, allowed individual um, uh, approval of individual wells without understanding the cumulative effects of the industry. If we think about environmentally, we just don't even know um, what the effect of, of thousands of wells are. Um, and I think the recent pipeline spills have shown too the um, underregulated nature of, um, and not just underregulated, but through austerity, um, the incapacity of the um, of the provincial government to actually enforce the regulations that do exist um, is a problem as well. Um, and, though, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. My question though is um, I'm less about regulation and more about in the balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, you've got, you, you've presented information on all sides of this and in terms of what's working, what's not. And in the balance, what's the message that you want me to take away from this? Um, and I'm not, I'm just, I'm just asking for a clarity around uh, because of your insights, both in the industry, you've traveled, um, mm -hmm. you know, do we, do, do we live with this ugly duck? Um, do we, do we think that this is a, an ugly duckling that's, that's about to, to do great things and, and emerge? Um, or, or is it, um, 
um, this is part of our history and, and we're trying to continue to live with it. I'm, I'm trying to figure out in the balance, mm. what side are we on um, from, your, from your investigation? Because I'm not clear. Yeah. Well, I would say like, it, I would like to see um, a, the transition to renewable energy sources begin tomorrow. Um, that doesn't mean that we would shut everything off tomorrow. But the point of the research, I think, is really to show, um, given this um, really heated debate in Canada now between, um, uh, you know, an urban environmentalists, that might be how rural people would characterize them on the one side, and those folks who live and um, and whose livelihoods are dependent on the oil industry, there isn't a lot of in-between ground, right? Both sides are writing each other off. And I think what I'm trying to do with my research is to show that although I think that um, we need to transition in a way and we need to do it now, we also need to understand um, what's at stake. And we need to represent and tell people's stories who are living these circumstances in ways that are faithful to their accounts and to then push the um, dialogue, I think, further. Um, but my attempt was really to say, you know, not to come from a position of, um, yeah, not to come from a position that would be hostile to, um, to rural communities, but to try to represent the real struggles that they're in. And absent, my opinion is that absent any political leadership that really offers an alternative, folks in these rural areas are, are going to um, dig in, right? They're going to be fiercely protective of what they have. Um, and I think in some ways, some of the discourse coming from um, maybe more urban environmental movements um, doesn't move folks in these areas towards um, a position of um, uh, of accepting, right, the a different economy, I guess. So yeah, in the balance, I think um, people, like I've tried to point out the sort of, even even those who are in good positions, the ways in which the industry is really detrimental in many ways to their lives, whether that's on a personal basis or whether that's through cyclical and seasonal ups and downs in the industry, it's a very difficult industry for people, but yet it's one that they can't imagine living without. Okay. Uh, thanks, Emily. We've, we've, um, you and I could talk some more around questions on this, and and, and it would be exciting. Um, I'm not. We're, we're not getting questions today in terms of the Q and A box at the bottom of the page. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll make this. Uh, of course, we'll make the presentation available to not only those that were online, but also uh, publicly available. Um, thank you for including your your uh, web address or your uh, email address as well as your blog address. Um, so There's one question there. Did you want? Oh, hang on. Go ahead. And, go ahead and take it then. <laughs> okay. So the question is, what measures or policies are being put in place to reduce oil's impact on the environment, and how effective are those measures? <clears throat> um, and I would say that I think because of the uh, media's uh, and social movement attention in the country, mostly on Alberta, that. Saskatchewan's largely received a pass. Um, and so there isn't a lot of pressure to um, implement um, these types of environmental uh, programs and, and um, ways of mitigating impacts. Um, but that also one thing that I wanted to highlight is where we have regulations that seem okay on paper, um, what I've found in my research is just the sheer incapacity of, of regulators to actually enforce them in the field. So it's one thing to say, to bring in a new directive that's aimed at decreasing venting and flaring, for example. Um, and But if you can't actually go and monitor people's, uh, what, what wells are emitting, um, then you can't actually do much about it. But I think there has been a little bit more um, attention on the industry since the Husky oil spill in July um, and there is, are increasing calls for at least better pipeline regulations. There was a um, an auditor's report several years back that really showed the gaping holes in regulation around pipeline, small pipeline, um, and it wasn't until this summer that the government decided that it would actually implement those um, those um, 
recommendations. So there are a few things coming down the line. I mentioned that there was a new directive on the venting and flaring. The problem with that one is that it's all dependent on, um, you, can, you can apply to opt out of conserving your gas um, if you're in financial distress and the industry now um, post 2014 is in a downturn and I think the government's being really permissive right now in terms of enforcing the regulations even that do exist because of um, the downturn. So there, I would just say on balance, yeah, there hasn't been much effort to mitigate the environmental impacts of oil and gas in the province. Thank you very much, um, Emily, with the uh, great presentation. Um, we suspect that others will download it, of course. Um, and again, the, uh, the capability of, of sending this out to not only the folks that signed up for it, but also to others uh, within our mailing list will we'll do that. Um, you'll get a copy of for sure in terms of, the, of where it's located. Um, greatly appreciate your time. I, I understand the, the challenges that you've got both um, not being on a day-to-day -day basis on campus and, and revisiting some of this, uh, this research for us. We really appreciate it. And, and we so appreciate the, uh, uh, the fact that you've brought in daycare for your child for, for the presentation. So um, all in all, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for having me. <laughs>